What's up guys, welcome back to another 2006 RM250 build and giveaway video. Today, a very special video just for you guys, not only because you can win this $25,000 plus dirt bike build, but because my friends at Panthera Motorsports sent you guys a brand new $1,500 electric starting system for this thing. Pretty unreal. So today we're gonna go over everything you guys get in the kit. We're gonna go over how to install this on your RM250 yourselves. And I wanna do a few other things while we have all the components free from the bike. For example, I wanna weigh this thing, figure out how much it adds to the bike. It does have a nice light lithium battery. We're gonna put all the components on the scale and see what it comes out to. So if you guys have been waiting to see what the Panthera e-start system for your RM250 is all about, maybe you didn't know about it at all today, this video is for you. I think you're really gonna enjoy it. Now this is just one more nail in the coffin for the ultimate RM250 build that you guys can win. So if you wanna take a crack at bringing it home, there are about 100 slots left, only 350 slots allowed total. You can visit mxrevival.com by smashing this little link, get yourselves entered. Let's go ahead and check out what the Panther e-start system comes with and what it's all about. All right, as we make our way over to the bench to check out all the brand new Panthera Motorsports e-start components, can we just take a quick moment to appreciate what's going on here. Guys, this is your bike, 2006 RM250. If you've been following the build series, you already know what's going on. You already know the amount of dollars and work that goes into a project like this. You know about the brand new OEM airbox, air boot, etc. You know about every single bolt in the entire chassis and engine being black zinc. You know about the handmade Hugo Performance cone pipe. You know about Lukey's fat head cylinder, the ICW radiators that are Seam welded, caged, gusseted, vapor blasted, filled with Evans wireless coolant. You know about the Electron Pro series with the new torque jet. You know about your big ass gal for brakes. You know about your AHM suspension coatings, DLC, RMZ Gold, your 2024 RMZ 450, brand new I might add, braking system on this bad boy. You know about special edition number plate. You know all that stuff already. But if you don't, guys, this is your bike. I hope you enjoy it much, much more. Check out the build series if you want to get caught up on everything else that's happened so far. Um, I wish I could keep this bike and uh, I'm not going to be able to. So let's go head over to the Panthera E-Star components, see what we got. Let's talk about everything that's included in this kit. This is it right here. All right, guys, here we are on the bench with the brand new badass, I might add, Panthera E-Star setup for the RM250. My first thoughts on this when opening it Incredibly robust. It's got some girth to it. We're going to talk about that. I got the scale right here. Uh, reliability wise, that is a good thing. And uh, this video may be a little bit information laden beyond the basics of the componentry and the install because there's just some things that have occurred to me as I've looked over the components, um, coupled with past experiences with flywheel weights, uh, crank seal leaks, etc. And uh, I'm going to get into all that as I go, just as it feels right. And I'm really excited about this. This is, this is a huge deal uh, for me. This is a huge deal for you. And I really want to say thank you very much to Panthera and especially you, Sebastian, for making this happen. This is, um, this is really cool. Uh, you guys know I love doing this for a living and it's a dream come true for me. So let's get into it. So first off, like any nice kit, comes with instructions, which as men, we probably won't read, but don't worry if you have to fall back on this. It's all in here. Every component, every piece, every tool you're going to need, you're going to see the tools as we go, but they're in here as a backup. So instructions. also have a note right here to talk about other models. If you guys don't have an RM250, they have YZ125, YZ250, old ass Yamaha Banshee, Suzuki Quadzilla, CR500, CR250, CR125. I don't know if I said KX250 and KX500 already, but these guys are absolutely assaulting the e-start thing right now. Um, if you guys saw the sneak peek on Ken Roxon's RMZ 450, then you saw the sneak peek. I'm gonna, not gonna say anything else about that for now. So guys, in the kit, as you can see, you got your new cover, all the gears, the housing, your starter motor itself. Nice pressed in bearings in here. All the gears that are gonna make things happen when it all goes together. You also have the gear here that's going to be affixed onto the end of our flywheel, which is not yet installed. It comes with a new shifter, which tells me there's probably some space in thickness taken up outward away from the engine that would require the use of a thinner arm on the shifter itself. So we're going to find out if we're going to need to use this, which I'm assuming you do, or if we can get away with the one that I already uh, doctored up for you, you know, the one that matches your bike. Otherwise, we'll have to do some customizing on the new shifter. 
You of course get your battery tray, your magic button right there. It's even yellow and black, so that works really well on this build. You know, I'm a stickler for little details like that. You've got your starter relay, fuses, uh, everything you need to get this kit working, basically. Up inside the airbox, you'll see where this goes soon. Kit comes with a special tool to affix said gear. We've got a vent hose. This is gonna be a breather because in addition to all this going together, this is actually gonna be oil bathed now. And we'll get into that later as well. Usually the left side of a two stroke engine is a dry side. And that's why I mentioned crank seals earlier. We'll get into that. You got a new gasket, that's great. A Little bit of hardware here. And then of course you have a really nice anti-gravity battery. It's really light. All these lith ion batteries nowadays are light and that's really good, uh, especially when we're adding weight to dirt bikes. And you guys already know that because I've blacked out every single bolt and a bunch of extras for such occasions as this in this motorcycle that I already have a special little tray just for all the bolts that are in this Panthera system. I've taken them all out, cross-referenced them to my little stash over here. And so at the end, we'll be doing a little bit of customizing. You'll see that in the final reveal video. Let's go ahead and get all these new components up on the scale, everything that's going to be added to your bike, get a total weight, and then I'll talk to you about why I think that's important, uh, what it might mean for your suspension. And in the meantime, we're gonna go ahead and get a charger on this battery here. It's been in transport, who knows how long it's been sitting. So when you guys are charging a lith ion battery, very important not to use a standard lead acid type uh, charger on a lith ion battery, you'll ruin it. My buddy Kevin owns Ride More up in Canada. He sent this our way for the previous BRC 500 build. I'll be using it. It actually switches from whatever type of battery you may have. It just knows and it clicks on appropriately. So I'll leave you guys a link for this. I'll get this hooked up and then we'll get everything on the scale. I'm ready. All right, got our super duper handy Waymax scale here. We are zeroed out. Let's go ahead and start stacking stuff on. I'm gonna try and stack everything I can at the same time. And I gotta be quick with this guy or keep making it fluctuate because it'll sort of lock in. I got a pile of stuff here. Let's see, gasket. I'm not gonna weigh the gasket. It weighs just about nothing. Shifter, I'm gonna leave that for now. That's just about all of it, minus the battery. So six pounds, 11.4 ounces there. Let's go ahead and get this stuff off. That's actually not as bad as I thought just by holding it. Get the battery on there and it's 14 ounces, so a little under a pound. So what was that? So altogether, if my math isn't wrong, that's about seven pounds, nine ounces for all this stuff. Now I wanna bring your attention to this main gear here that goes right onto locking via these two pins, much like a flywheel holder tool, onto the flywheel itself. Now, if you guys are familiar with flywheel weights, uh, basically it's a weight you add to the end of your flywheel here to create a little more inertia as your engine's spinning which makes it easier to start, much harder to stall. A lot of off-road guys prefer a nice heavy flywheel, maybe a 13 ounce is the most I've ever seen. And I, I don't even think off-road guys like to go that far. MX guys, maybe a six ounce. And the best way to describe it is by feel, your two stroke might feel more like a four stroke or a three stroke, if you will. So it definitely helps with hookup traction, reduces wheel spin and stuff. Um, but the heavier you go, the more tame the engine's going to be, the more torque it's going to seem to feel to have by the seat of the pants, and they don't reduce horsepower. They just kind of really reduce the wind up uh, of your engine's RPM. Uh, lighter flywheel does the opposite. And uh, so that's why everyone loves the RM250, at least in magazine tests, is it's got a super light flywheel, but it's a copy of the YZ cylinder. So it's uh, like a light switch. It's a very two-strokey two-stroke, but uh, right now we're adding like I said, a 13 ounce would be huge. That right there, a pound is 16 ounces. So 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21.2 ounces to the end of your stock flywheel here. This is uh, an, a mega amount of extra flywheel weight. So I wanted to bring that to your attention because that is going to make this bike, I think I've never ridden a bike with a, that much extra flywheel weight, feel like a freaking tractor. So this should really add, in addition to having a magic button, add a lot of traction, hookup, uh, a slower revving power style. You can probably mess with your power valve. We won't get into all that and make it open sooner or whatever, but um, that is a lot of extra flywheel weight. And I'm really curious to see what that feels like. 
let's get into the install. Now to quickly round out my thoughts about weight and why I thought that was even important to mention in the first place is that if you guys are doing a build, say like this from the ground up where you're considering uh, what your total rider, your body weight is, uh, your skill level, all that stuff to have your suspension valved, it would be worth considering when you're getting your suspension redone, sprung properly for your weight plus the bike's weight, which is usually a known variable by a suspension company. Now you have an extra, let's just call it eight pounds. So for the most part, it's probably not going to affect much. The weight is centrally located, but if you're a stickler for every little detail, this is just something I thought you will want to think about, bring up to your suspension tuner. Uh, you could also lose some weight. If you need to lose some weight, that's never a bad thing. And while most of the people who get into an e-start system like this aren't gonna think about that in the first place, uh, aren't gonna notice it, they're just gonna be stoked to have a magic button and then some of that extra flywheel weight it might just not be a big deal. Now, here's one more thing you guys can do to reduce that weight burden. I'm just gonna call it a burden because some people would think gaining weight is bad, not necessarily all the time. Uh, here's something I think you could do to combat that if you wanted to, especially if you're just an MX guy and you're not out on the trails uh, in need of a backup starting option. Now, if you're someone who just hates extra weight and you can't stand the thought of it, here's something I think you could do, not I think, I know you could do to reduce some of that weight or come back down on the scale. You could go ahead, pull your primary cover off. You could delete not only your kickstart arm, the steel knuckle that's on it, uh, the bolt here, but everything inside, the kick gear, the spring, the little tab that holds it back into place when it comes back forward after you've used it. You could get rid of all that stuff. I'm gonna be willing to bet that's probably a couple pounds, not a ton, but it's something you could do. All you would need to do thereafter is get a seal for this to block this off, much like the 17 CRF 450R that had an optional e-start. It still had this Kickstarter boss on it here. I think the 18 came with a starter and the plug in it, something like that. You can Google that for an idea. You can find these seals online all day long, just measure the diameter of your bore or hole in your primary cover and you're good to go. Just something I thought you guys might enjoy. Of course, if you're a trail guy, you're probably gonna hate the sound of that. For myself, if I had an RM250 and I was an MX guy only, which my bikes are purposefully for MX or off-road only, I would do this right away. This is just something I would do because I would have fun doing it. I'll reduce a little bit of that weight. And like I said, if you're a trail guy, I know you dudes love to have a backup start option. For me, I find a hill, roll down it, bump start the damn thing. All right, here we are. We got the bike on its side. It is time to install little preview of what she's going to look like right there. Your electric start system. This thing is freaking cool. So the first thing I'm going to do is pop off this stock ignition cover. I think it does look pretty sweet though. It's brand new. I think I told you guys I found this in the Netherlands. Uh, new old stock. One of the last ones probably out there. And uh, had it coated by Dean at Fast Blast and Coat. Got the logo brushed off for you. The reason this is on is because Yesterday I was doing some prep for this video, getting everything inside tidied up, and I'm gonna show you what I did right now because if you're opening yours up, your running bike uh, that you are putting an e-start on, it's gonna look a little bit different than this one. So once this cover's off, we will get into exactly what all happened yesterday. All right, let's jump in. I told you guys earlier this video is gonna be very information laden. Uh, wherever I see fit to kind of deep dive on some stuff I think is important. Um, if you need a more cut and dry instructional video, Panthera does have one as well, or you can put the playback on 2X speed if you're not interested in hearing me yap, but it's what I do and I'm gonna do it because I think it's important. So first things first, uh, you guys heard me earlier say, this is now going to be oil bath. Normally on a two stroke, this side is dry, meaning the crank seal behind this crank and behind this stator plate uh, would usually give some failure symptoms of like, high revving or erratic idle if it were going bad. Well, now this is gonna be under oil, much like a four stroke or exactly like a four stroke, you might have some different symptoms. So you're no longer gonna have a dry side crank seal and then on the clutch side, the other side of this engine, a wet side clutch seal that would give you some other symptoms if it were failing like uh, transmission oil coming out of your exhaust pipe, for example. So something to be aware of if, and because a lot of you guys are gonna have used bikes that these e-start systems are going on to. You're gonna have used crank seals. Uh, you're probably gonna have a lot more dirt and debris in here. This engine's just been rebuilt. Uh, I took the entire stator magneto apart, vapor blasted the plate. There's no dirt in here whatsoever. So you're gonna have those things uh, to combat when you're doing this. Uh, so on that note, make sure you get everything as clean as possible. It might be a little bit difficult 
And also know that in the future, uh, now that you have an oil bath side here, uh, rather than dry like normal, you might have some mixed symptoms if this crank seal goes bad. Maybe a mix of some of the usual stuff, high idle, erratic idle, whatever, mixed with some oil coming out of your exhaust pipe. You'll figure it out, but I just wanted you to know that that could be a thing that you deal with in the future. The second thing I want to bring up here is that uh, yesterday I spent a lot of time rebuilding and uh, reheat shrinking and sealing up this housing because of the oil. And so you guys are going to see today the use of some 1211. This is uh, something that you would use to seal, say, Yamaha case halves. So it's obviously very oil resistant and will stand the test of time. You can also use something like this. I believe Panthera recommends a black silicone. You could probably use Yama Bond as well. I'm going to go with the 1211 because I know that it's going to work. It's also extremely easy to clean up. And I'm going to show you the two places to start where this actually went on. So first things first, and the reason I had that cover on, that stock cover, is because this grommet here, this is off my 97 RM250. Can you believe it's not torn? This grommet right here on this bike, on your bike, needed to be pressed into place. So I 1211'd this stuff here, this gap around this grommet, and then forced it back into the engine case over here. Then I used the cover to push it down overnight and get it to seat. So as you guys can see, it's got a nice even seal there or seat. And you can see the white is the 1211, the gasket maker product that's around it. So that is going to be nice and oil tight now. You can also see the custom bushing in the back there I made. So I had something for the heat shrink to grab onto as your wires came out of the engine. Anyways, the next place you're going to put 1211 or sealant of your choice, it's going to be down underneath the stator plate. Let me get pinky here to illustrate. There is a drain right here because this is normally dry on these two strokes that needs to be filled with silicone because we don't want all the oil you're going to put in here to lubricate your starter assemblies, gears, etc., to drain out and weep out the bottom of the case. So we're going to fill that with some silicone. On the topic of stators, etc., a lot of those models I mentioned earlier, like the Yamahas and some other, maybe the CRs, they come, if you like, with an optional uh, stator, a higher output stator that will actually charge the battery that goes in this bike when this is all done. For the RM 2001 to 2008, you get a battery only that is not rechargeable because it's using your stock lower output stator. So your battery, you're going to have to keep tabs on it, charge it once in a while. You're using your stock RM250 stator and all that stuff. So like I said, you can opt for a charging system for other models, not for the RM250, but something to think about. And like I said, for me, for an MX guy, I'll just put the damn thing on the tender once in a while. It's really not that big of a deal. Now, when you guys get a fresh tube of 1211, it's going to come with one of these tips, thankfully, because that thing is way down there and I don't want to take anything back out because I've already seated that rubber grommet into the engine case. So see if we can't reach down in here and get some of this stuff shot into. Oh yeah. I know it's a little blurry for you guys. I apologize. It's going to be what it's going to be. Just load that bad boy up. And there she is with the old drippy tip. Not good. Now I'm going to try and use this spudger, which is a cool little plastic pencil type thing for scraping gaskets so that you don't mar your cases or whatever. And I'm going to use it to sort of try and wipe or press more of that 1211 down into the case. And right now we're also using gravity with the bike on its side to get it to sort of weep into that hole while it's still nice and pliable. You guys can see how liquid it still is. So the gravity should help a lot in this case. Let's see if we can't launch a little bit more 1211 in there. Not my best looking work, I'll admit, but hey, whatever gets the job done. Now the next step for us is to install our flywheel. Now if you guys are putting this e-start system on your used bike, this is already going to be installed. You're going to have a nut in here. You're going to just remove that nut. And something that the instructions mention is that the drive gear here, where it has these two tabs that lock into your existing flywheel. As you can see, mine drop in just very nicely. There's even a little bit of give there. Yours might be a little corroded, might be a little rusty. This thing's been vapor blasted and cleaned up to the max here. And so I have a lot of real estate to play with in regards to what's happening here. So you might need to pull yours off. You might need to clean it. Probably a good idea anyways, because all that dirt 
mixed with this oil, kicking around, going through your bearings that are going to be part of your e-start system, not good. And we'll get to uh, a little more about how to flush that after your first run as well pretty soon. So let's install this. Also got a brand new Woodruff key, this little guy here. This is what holds the thing to the crank. There's a little groove in the end of the crankshaft here. Uncle Tony over at uh, our other channel, MX Skillshack, got me on the Maxima sauce. So we're going to put a little bit of this onto the end of the crankshaft here. Get everything to slide on real nice like. Right, we'll see how lucky I get. I've got this Woodruff key glued to the end of Pinky here with some Maxima assembly grease. Let's see what I can get away with. Nope, not going to fit. Well, I got it in there. Regrettably, I did not catch it. But then again, this video is not about Woodruff keys. You guys probably won't have to deal with this. I grabbed it with the pliers, dropped it in there, and just pushed it in with Pinky. So now let's get that flywheel on and carry on with today's show. Souse. All right, do my best to line that bad boy up. And I think I've got a positive lock on that Woodruff key. I have a lock between the crank and the stator there, or the flywheel rather. Now, I don't recall if the Suzuki manual uses a thread locker on the nut that would have been on your flywheel, but I'm not going to risk it coming off using little red stuck nuts. This is a really awesome brand uh, for motorsports enthusiasts, specifically the off-road community. And we're going to put some of that on there just in case and start to cinch that bad boy up. Like I said, I'm not going to risk having that come off, especially when there's so much half-inch drive plus the tool they give you. To loosen it if you ever need to, you'll break this stuff free, but we don't want that happening while you're out there riding. Grind your cover, no good. Next up, drop our little half inch adapter in there. The set torque with the torque wrench down below. I'm set at 42 foot pounds, manual calls for 40. A little extra won't kill us. Just a phobia we got. We also got the special tool from Panthera that's going to hold this drive gear like so, and it will require the use of another half inch drive apparatus such as this. And I think if I let this thing fly down, it will rest right on my foot peg and I'll be able to set torque and kind of have both my hands. That'll be kind of nice. There we go. That's a nice sturdy tool they made. That's for sure. Now this tool is leaving a little bit of metal flake behind, probably from what looks to be the laser cut of it here. So I'm gonna have to blow this out, but I did get a little debris in there. Something to think about. Also threw a little bit of Maxima grease on this too because that sucker is a tight fit. Come on. A little BJ action. Can we talk about how sick your bike is? It, it just, <clears throat> you guys are, oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> it's crazy. So next up guys, we're going to go ahead and throw on the gasket though. I'm going to use a gasket that did not come in the kit. This is the gasket from the original engine gasket kit. It's paper. It's kind of thick. I'm going for some cheap insurance on an oil seal. That is not to say that this included gasket from Panthera, which looks to be much like, if not exactly like, a Cometic brand gasket with a metal core. This is really good stuff. I just want a little bit of uh, cheap insurance out of that thicker gasket. So you will get that other gasket in your kit, however. Now, Panthera wants you guys to put a little bit of silicone on this black rubber grommet we talked about earlier. I'm going to go ahead and bust out the 1211 again, and we're going to use it all the way around, just like sealing up a set of engine cases, center cases. Just going to go ahead and get a little bit. It goes such a long way and start dabbing it along this edge here. And uh, you guys heard me say earlier, I like how easy it is to use because it cleans up nice. If you don't get it all over the place, it wipes off really easily. So as I'm making my way around, anything that squishes out when we do the final tightening, it'll just wipe right off. It's so freaking nice. Now, if it's easier for you, you can take that 1211 and you can sort of just wipe it all over your gasket as well. And uh, here we go. We're going to drop that on. I'll also kind of help tack it into place a little bit, which is pretty nice. Next steps here, we're going to need to go ahead and remove this cover from the Panthera E-Start housing. And it's going to reveal a couple gears, another gasket, and we need to get those out of the way in order to access the final one, two, three, fourth hole that will allow us to mount it to the engine. As you guys can see, some witness marks on there. I did a dry run just to make sure as we're going through that everything's going to fit and work properly. There are some depth specifications for how far 
this should or should not be out ultimately when you're done tightening it. Those are going to be in the direction, so be mindful of those. Okay, all the hardware is out. Pop this off. Don't drop your gasket. There you go. Cover with some bearings, some gears in there. We need to go ahead and take the gears out. This one here is going to rotate the assembly that's bolted to your flywheel, which is driven by this gear, which is driven by the starter motor. Pretty freaking slick. Going back in with a little more 1211 on the gasket. You can dab this on the back of your Panthera E-Start cover too, if you'd like. So you guys can see in the center, this bearing has lots of grease inside of the rollers, which is awesome. Gonna give it a little more maxima anyway. This is gonna rest here on the end of this fastener. You'll also notice the breather elbow on the back of this cover. That's gonna come into play later. We have a breather hose to route that you guys saw earlier in the video. Go ahead and drop this thing on. I'm trying to make sure that all of my cover holes are lined up with the engine because the 1211, I don't want to spin this thing if I can avoid it. So Panther is going to send you guys four of these Allen head screws to affix this cover. The shortest one goes up top behind that gear door. And then it also comes with another copper crush washer here. That's to drain the oil out later. So this is just a backup. It came with one installed on it. Now the shortest one here is going to go up top behind those drive gears. And earlier in my dry run, when I got this bolt seated as far as I could go, I wasn't seeming to get a purchase or a squish on that gasket. And I could tell because when the bolt was as tight as I could get it by hand, and then a little bit by wrench actually, or ratchet, I had a little bit of flexion in the head like it wasn't biting the cover down. So we're gonna see if that happens again. All of these have been tapped uh, for glass bead media from the vapor blasting. And I ran a tap through it again and it was clean. So that bolt might be a little on the long side. I've got a backup here, so no worries if so. I wanna make sure we don't have any gaps in that uh, gasket for oil, obviously. Man, that looks so badass. It almost doesn't even need the customization, but you know, how can we resist? So I'm just gonna take these slowly until I feel the cover start to kind of land on that gasket and then we'll set some torque I'm also keeping an eye on that 1211. I want to make sure it squishes its way out. And as far as the depth of the gear and everything, it, everything seems all right. And that, do we get a purchase this time? Seems okay. I might have tapped a little bit of more junk out of that hole. Didn't seem to when I pulled the tap out, but this bolt up top seems like it's doing what it's supposed to do now. So that is sick. All right guys, so Panthera does want you to use a light duty or blue thread locker, in our case, stuck nuts, on these particular bolts, all four. I'm not gonna be doing that, but I wanna make sure you guys know too, because as you know, we're gonna swap these out for black. So for now, we're just trying to portray the product uh, as you're going to receive it, minus the gasket, of course. And so the next step would be get yourself a clean rag and wipe off that excess 1211 rolling your finger as you go and you guys can see use it sparingly because even the a low amount we put on there still squished out and this stuff just comes right off right off it's so nice to clean at this point before you install your two drive gears here you would want to fill this up with 300 cc's of atf is what panthera recommends i have a couple of these left over because you dump one of these in your trans you end up about 750 cc, you got a couple hundred left. So two oil changes on one of these two strokes will leave you more than enough at the end of these bottles to fill this guy up. And you're gonna wanna change this every time you dump your tranny oil. So every couple of rides, every couple of hours, hopefully that's what you guys are doing. And especially as mentioned earlier, if you guys have like a dirty area inside your engine, your stator side is dirty because your bike is used, it's old, whatever dirt's been getting in, whatever it may be, you're gonna to wanna to flush this for sure after your first ride and get all those contaminants out that you couldn't reach by hand when you were cleaning to install your e-start, fill it up fresh. So do it every hour if you have to, whatever it takes to get that stuff out because you don't want all those particles going through all these bearings, you know, obviously. So use ATF if you got it and use regular HP Trans from Honda or Maxima or whatever your oil of choice is that you use in your transmission in here too, it'll probably be fine. Another reason they may suggest using ATF in here instead of regular trans oil is that ATF 
typically has a lot of uh, cleaning agents in it. So things that will keep scrubbing, so to speak. I know some guys put a quarter ATF in their truck engines a couple hundred miles before they do an oil change. And I guess when engine builders take their engines down years later, the engines are very clean from the detergents that are in ATF. So like I said, that may be why they suggest ATF. Use whatever you want. Time to go ahead and get our gears into the housing here. So you're gonna take this gear first, the one that engages the starter motor, drop it down with these teeth that face downward. We'll install this one next. The gear on the back, the nut on the front. That's the orientation of this. This one inside is going to grab the gear internally, which while we're there, as you can see, still sprints freely. We don't have any bind. If that's something you're gonna watch out for as you're torquing everything down. If you get any bind, something's a little off. And drop that in, get the teeth to engage. Very nice. You guys can see here in this cover, you have bearings grabbing each end of these drive gears. That's really cool. It's just a nice, robust way to construct this here. Get all these in as well. I'm gonna go ahead and recommend a little bit of blue thread locker on these. Again, we're not doing it because we're gonna do some bolt customization. And also, again, that would have been your chance to fill this thing with the recommended ATF or trans oil of your choice while those gears were out. Definitely wanna give our 1211 and that weep hole at the bottom of this thing a little more time before we put some oil as well. Oh man, that looks so trick on your bike. All the silver in the logo looks really good with the vapor blasting on your cylinder and cases. Oh, it's gonna look awesome with the black hardware. The fit and finish has been amazing. Shape of the cover is really, really cool. It just looks badass. Next up guys, we need to install this breather hose. You saw earlier the 90 degree barbed fitting on the back of this starter motor housing. And so we're just gonna snap it on there real easy. If you'd like for safety, you can put a little bit of tie wire, safety wire, zip tie on it, whatever you want. Find the routing you like the best. Panthera recommends routing this no less than a foot above the unit itself and leaving a loop at the top. That way, rather than cutting it and having it sticking straight up, you won't have any elements, water, whatever, getting into it, a drip loop, if you will. So I'll probably run up with the ignition wiring back here, find a nice place to make my loop so I can tie this nicely, zip ties, black ones, of course, and then flip it back down, maybe around the fuel tank mount, something like that. So we'll see where we end up. Do it the way you like best. Make sure to get a foot up and make sure to make a loop so you don't get any water inside this bad boy. With everything else out of the way, and this is actually the first step, that the Panthera manual will recommend you start with. We need to install the battery tray, the battery, all the wiring, and the magic button. So let's go ahead and get this thing unwrapped, unravel it into the bike, see what we're working with, see if we can't get this thing to turn over. Here we are up top. I've got the battery tray here, starter relay, all the wiring that comes with it attached to it. Got some heavy duty cables. That's really nice. These are probably, I don't know, they look like a number six, but they could be smaller underneath the jacket, maybe an eight. Whatever it is, robust, nice heat shrink sheath over this bad boy. This thing is meant to drop right into your air box like so, and the seat actually holds it down. So what's nice about that is that when you want to service your air filter, which you guys are doing every single ride, right? Flip this thing out of the way, do your air filter, pop it back in when you're done, good to go. So gets bit down by the seat. Now some interesting things about the non-charging system that we have in our bike, non-charging meaning we don't have a stator with high enough output to recharge the battery. So you guys are gonna get about 100 starts out of each battery between charges. So they say, if not 125. So just keep it charged like we talked about. This connector here with the yellow leads in it, which leads out to the other end there is for the charging type systems that they sell. So. I could delete those. I could have to take this sheath apart, take those out, and I might do that later on. But for now, we're gonna go ahead and install it as it's received. And those wires and connectors are gonna come in every harness because uh, it's the same harness for every unit. So this will drop in here. And on the RM, I was looking for a good spot to have these wires exit, especially because as some of you guys know, this is a brand new OEM airbox. Airbox, boot, mud flap, everything attached to it brand new, so I didn't want to cut it, but uh, I am gonna have to make a notch right here. And this is exactly where Panthera recommends you do it. So a lot of bikes, if you're lucky enough to still have one because they are now obsolete from Suzuki, will have a rubber flap that hooks onto some posts down here and it comes out and forward. 
That's so that when you're washing your bike or going through the elements or whatever it may be, water doesn't jump up through here. So it looks like if I notch this corner for these wires to come out, we're still gonna be able to use our wash flap. I was able again to find one at cmsnlparts.com from the Netherlands and uh, have that sent to my buddy Josh at 3DP Moto. We're trying to 3D print those with some other cool Suzuki stuff, CDI sleeves, etc. more on that later, um, so that you guys can get them even though they're no longer available. At any rate, we're gonna go ahead and notch right here. So I'm gonna stuff the wires underneath this tab. This is a tab that holds the two tangs on your seat down so your seat isn't flicked up. If you guys see that your tabs are bent, uh, it's because you're not hooking your seat underneath them. So Take care of that. I'm just gonna get a Sharpie and make a little line now that this is tucked as far over as I can tuck it, right about the width of the harness. So I have sort of a, a guide to snip or cut with. You guys can use a Dremel, you guys can use dikes, you can use whatever you want, but uh, just do your best to cut it nice and straight and then you'll have an exit for those wires. Okay, so our exit is over here under this tab. Hopefully you guys can see what's happening well enough. I know this tab is kind of in your way. I've just got some dikes here. I'm gonna go ahead and get it right on my Sharpie mark, which again was just the width of those wires. Get them sunk in all the way, get one big cut. Go ahead and jump over to a razor blade and try and cut on that mold line I was talking about. You guys can use a heat gun to get the plastic warm first if you want, and then this blade will travel through it like butter. I'm just gonna go for it here. Not being a very good role model right now, using some sort of apparatus to hold the knife, so. Don't cut yourself, guys. If I get cut, we'll just call it good cinema for today. All right, I think we are free. There is my little chunk. It's pretty minimal. Didn't want to cut a brand new air box, but <laughs> it's done and over with, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. All right, let's lace this sucker through the bike. I'm gonna start with the longest here. We got basically the magic button wires, the two leads for that, followed by negative cable followed by positive cable. I might have to sort of bend this thing, arc it around, get it to pop out like we want. There we go. Now we can sort of drag this thing straight out and there'll be some more routing, of course, down towards the starter itself and the handlebars. If you guys want to open your air box up a little bit more, which now that I'm looking at all this, this hole is tucked so nicely behind this upper part of the subframe that we're not going to have any water intrusion issues anyways, but you can open yours up a little bit more and that's going to give you a little bit more ease of pass through. I'm sort of beating up the heat shrink on this as I go through, which is going to make it look pretty ugly because I tried to make the hole so incredibly small. If you guys like, you can also pull this relay off the battery tray so you don't have it swinging around on the end, hitting you in the legs and cutting you in the back of the arm, all that stuff. Also, if you guys want, I just found an easier way to do it. I'm so concentrated on trying to get this to pass through the little nook I made. Didn't really occur to me. Just go in front of the air box here, underneath this bolt where the subframe is. You got tons of room here. You won't scrape anything up. And as you can see, it moves a lot easier. So being kind of a dummy there. But once you get it where you want it, then you can sort of force it down. Also because the air box is pliable into that little cut we made earlier. And that's... Almost perfect. Now we can go ahead and lay in our battery tray. This thing is very nicely bent. It doesn't have any odd rub points on it. Everything drops right in with ease, which is really nice. It seems to be pretty strong, which is also great. It looks like a piece of stainless, so it's not gonna corrode on you. It does come with some rubber strips in the bottom. So any shocks that your battery is going to incur, not electrical shocks, but vibrational shocks. It does nice to have those down in there. Drop that in there. I think we're just about right with all this where we like it. Might be a little bit more sneaking to do. Go ahead and slide these tabs back through your starter relay, housing, holder, whatever you want to call it. I think I've got that backwards. I'm making contact with that fuse. Yeah, we'll get a little more depth out of it in this direction. Just notice also comes with an extra fuse. So if you guys pop a fuse in this starter relay, got a spare 20 amp fuse on board, that's nice. Now that we've got the relay back onto the battery tray and we have all these wires sort of passing through or swooping through without crisscrossing each other, without tangling over each other and making it harder to manipulate this battery tray, we can go ahead and just lay this sucker in here like so. Our length is really good on the exit here of the harness. So I'm happy with that. I don't have a bunch of bind. It is sort of 
torsioning the cage or the tray up a little bit, I might be able to toggle that out and get some of that torsion out of it. You guys figure out what's right for you. Again, it's loose in here anyways, being that it's held down by the seat. This thing's pretty much ready for the battery, which we're not gonna do yet, because if we hook it up to the battery right now, without the other end connected, we kind of create a dangerous condition where we can have some arcing. We touch the positive and negative cables on the other side. So we'll jump back up to the air box a little bit later. Also, one thing to note, if you guys wanted to, like I was mentioning earlier, de-sheath all this stuff, take the heat shrink off, take the charging system wires out because you don't need them, you can. Or if you just don't like the look of this here, you can get a small, small machine type flathead screwdriver and push some little tabs that hold these metal pins in and they'll actually pop out of the connector. So you can at least delete the connector, wrap some tape around them. You could also go ahead and tape this too. But if you want to delete some of this bulk, you certainly can. Otherwise, put it out of the way, hit it with some electrical tape and zip tie it to the side, something like that. You'll figure it out. All right, our tray is mounted. Our wires are coming out of the hole we cut. There's a triangulated portion of this frame right here, which is a perfect pass-through for this wiring harness here. As you can see, it splits. We're gonna do some modifying, cut the sheath back a little bit so we can get these to the right places. Also, something that's pretty awesome, this fastener right here that goes in your frame, you can still get these new on the Suzuki Microfish. It's probably gonna work perfectly to hold that harness. Well, not perfectly yet, but that might work perfectly to hold that in place. Goes around the shock nicely. This is actually for the TPS and power jet wires that would go to your stock carburetor normally. So that might pan out just right. So when it comes to the sheathing that I beat up on the uh, wiring harness here, we're gonna trim it back a little bit because where these two separate parts of the loom start to Y or come apart, I would like this to be a little bit higher so I can hide it underneath the gas tank just a little bit better. So what I'm gonna do is force everything up top here, see kind of what I need for the battery, which is just about perfect right there. And basically what I'm trying to avoid is to have this start to drop down and then turn back up. If I can split this sheathing a little higher up, I can get it to Y right at the fastening point up above here of the main power and negative wire. So I'll go ahead and do some more free range razor blading. Obviously be careful not to cut yourself or your wires, it happens. They actually make these really cool little utility knives that have the blade tucked into this U shape so that you can peel cords and peel sheathing and do exactly what I'm trying to do right now. I'm just gonna score that a little bit. Definitely just dragging it on there. I'm not really pushing on it at all. I want that thing to have a nice clean break when I get up to that point. And worked out pretty well. So. There you have it. Now I can Y these a little bit sooner. As a better illustration of that, I'm now Ying these right where I wanted to. So I'll be fastening the loom here with a zip tie. Could even use one of these grooves for the fuel tank rest. And then the starter button wires can continue forward. And at the same point, the battery negative and positive cables can go down. So I'll do an overview on all the wiring path when we're done, but that's the idea right there. Now that we have good routing, we can go ahead and connect our positive cable first. You always wanna connect negatives last when you're working with the DC system. We'll go ahead and get down below and get this guy snuck through and connected to the starter motor casing itself. You may have to bend your ring terminal there. That way you can sit nice and flat or square against that housing when everything is bolted back together. Give her a little cinch, not too much for now. Again, we'll be changing those out. Man, we are almost done with this install. One of the last steps aside from the battery is to go ahead and install the magic button. So right at the point where we V'd our wiring harness earlier, which is right where this ugly and don't worry, temporary zip tie is installed. I snuck the charging system connector and the magic button wiring loom through the frame right behind the coil. And we can go ahead and send it on its way up, get behind this number plate, pop it out up here. Now we can take the magic button up to the handlebars, get it situated, figure out what kind of wire length we have left over, how we want to dress things. Then we can throw that battery in and we're just about done. I'm going to go ahead and mount our magic button right here. And I like that there's enough clearance underneath the wire where it exits uh, to clear the back strap or the bar mount for the brake master cylinder. And this really keeps things decluttered by mounting it on the side. Not only that's the same as some of the new 450 or 250 four strokes, but also away from the kill switch. 
So we'll send this wire out this way, get some zip ties on that bad boy. And of course we've got our little hooks that come with it so we can mount it to the bars. Get those guys in there, sling them around, tighten up that screw, and that could not be easier. Go ahead and connect that magic button into the harness. All right, while well, we were hard at work on your badass giveaway dirt bike, you can see we are fully charged. You can also see that this charger auto-selected lithium. So really sweet. Let's go ahead and get this thing into your motorcycle. We meet again at the battery tray. Now this kit comes with these little connector covers. Very cool. Just throw them over your positive and negative battery cable ends and you're good to go. Next up, you can throw your extreme power series anti-gravity battery into your battery tray. You can buy this electric start kit from Panthera with or without the battery. They give you the option, so that's cool. Positive, negative, make sure they're on the right sides. Drop the bad boys in there. Very snug fit. You guys can see it'll stay wherever I put it. That's really cool. So as this thing's hitting jumps, whoops, rocks, logs, whatever you guys are into, it's not going to be bouncing around like a piece of junk. Have to pop that thing out so we can get our terminals lined up and connected. Be a little easier with the battery loose. Now there are a couple of positive leads and a couple of negative leads, so be aware of that. I'm going to go ahead and go through the larger cable terminal first, followed by the smaller underneath. Get that thing connected to the battery. I'm gonna leave it somewhat loose for now so I can figure out final fitment, how I need to bend the wires as we push everything back in. You have pretty much an identical setup on the negative side over here. A Couple of say 14 gauge wires and then your battery negative. Couple those together, get a screw through them. In my case, I'm gonna have to give this a bit of a spin to actually get it to line up with the battery terminal properly. They can be stubborn, don't worry. I'm gonna give it a little tap. Nothing happened, that's good. We wanna make sure we don't have any shorts like a bad switch and it just starts running the starter right away so i can tap that nothing happens we know we have isolation of power uh, through all the circuitry so that's really good i gotta sneak those fancy dust covers back up here get them close and really i need to slide all the wires through these dust covers both of these ring terminals on each side for them to fit properly and get pretty close right there give everything a snug Solid on both sides, got our dust covers. Now as we push this back down into the tray, we're gonna have the cables wanting to twist, turn, become U-shaped. Just make sure down inside of here, especially on the positive side, that this positive wire looping from your battery to the starter relay is not rubbing on the battery tray because it's sharp enough that over time it will wear its way through. You'll have a dead short. You have a nice big arc right there. If you need to make this wire, the short wire to the relay on the positive side flow a little bit better, you can loosen it on the relay. There's a 10 millimeter nut in here and you can sort of shape the wire the way you want it, bolt it all back together. And that's if it's giving you any issues. Right now, it's pretty much perfect out of the box. I've got no problems with it. Last step, battery strap. Kind of don't even remember how it went on, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but uh, as you can see, you can lift this thing back up Drop it back in, no problems. I'm guessing that went there. That seems about right. We'll look at some pictures, but for now, something like that. And just like that, you spoiled rotten bastards have yet one more amazing component on your bike. The electric start. You're welcome. Thank you, Panthera. Guys, you have electric start. Not only is it an 06 RM250, one of the best years ever made of this machine, but now you can start it with the push of a button. Well, Almost. Now my final thoughts on the Panthera E-Start as of right now, everything is built beautifully. Everything fit perfectly. Everything is really robust. I really like seeing the bearings on either side of every drive gear inside the starter housing. The cover feels very durable. We got seven, eight pounds of extra mass on there and I can feel where it is and some of the key components like the cover. It's certainly a lot sturdier than some of the plastic covers that come on these bikes. And it was just so easy to install. You take what you already have, you bolt a few components to it, like the drive gear on the end of your flywheel, which basically only goes on one way. You can't really screw it up and it just bolts together perfectly. So not only was it fun to film and show you guys, and I really hope you learned something, but it's not gonna be intimidating for anyone who's trying it for the first time. Now finishing up here with your over the top 2006 
RM250 build and giveaway, I need to do, as mentioned, a little bit of customizing to the Panthera components that showed up. I also want to redress some of the wires, some of the heat shrink that I beat up during install, some of the stuff that I cut off during the reroute, so we'll get everything dressed nice and tight, hidden really well. As it sits, the wiring harness had more than enough length for everything. There's actually quite a bit extra up at the starter button that I'm going to possibly even cut and butt splice solidly. And other than that, I need to go ahead and polish your tank, get that installed, get some fresh fuel in it, get your final decals on. And after this video, that's it guys. I'm gonna start running ads for this thing. I'm gonna do the final reveal video. You're gonna hear it start up for the very first time, thanks to Panthera. No one's probably ever gonna use the Kickstarter again on this thing. And after that, we'll be picking a winner for this bad boy. So again, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. I had a blast filming it and installing this for you. If you guys wanna win this beast, you already know what to do. Head over to mxrevival.com. Like I said at the top of this video, only about 100 slots left out of a 350 total allowable. So guys, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching Panthera. Thank you for being a part of my amazing build team. Of course, guys, all the links to Panthera are below. Social, website, you can check out all the other e-start systems they sell for all the bikes I mentioned earlier. I appreciate the time you guys always take out of your day to spend with me on YouTube. That means a lot to me. So until next time, I will see you in the full reveal video with the first start. Shred safe. I'll see you there.